Hi, I'm Jeremy. And I'm Ben. And together we are 15 Degrees North. Today we're going to show you the sights and sounds of the Cotswolds. The Cotswolds is a region in southwest England that straddles Somerset, Gloucestershire, Oxfordshire, Wiltshire, Worcestershire, and Warwickshire. Well, that's a lot of shires. Or shires. It's a protected landscape made up of grassland, a habitat rare in the UK, and it's known for its distinctive golden coloured Cotswold stone, which is used for most buildings in the area. We've visited the region for a five day trip and we'll be counting down our picks of the 12 prettiest towns and villages in the Cotswolds. Before heading off to its absolute highlight, England's very best palace. But we could not resist having a poke around in Stratford upon Avon first, the medieval town that can claim to be home of the most famous Brit of all time, William Shakespeare. The town revolves around this legacy and traces of Shakespeare can be seen everywhere. Statues, the Royal Shakespeare Company, theatre and any building associated to him has been preserved. So, we live in England, but we don't live in the Cotswolds. There we go. Why is that? At number 12, we start in Broadway, not to be mixed up with the New York Theatre District. Although, to be fair, they are pretty similar. Number 11. Burford is a quaint little town with its steep streets lined with gorgeous authentic cottages. Number 10. And I don't mean Downing Street, but Painswick. Painswick is cute, unlike Boris Johnson, but it's the topiary trees in the churchyard that really made this one stand out. I love those trees. You really did, didn't you? Living in the industrial north, I think it's fairly easy to forget that places like this exist in England and they do exist in abundance down here in the south and the Cotswolds is just this beautiful untouched area of outstanding beauty of architecture and rolling countryside and it's just everything that people want from the English countryside I think. For number 9 we go to Snows Hill which revolves around the remarkable Snows Hill Manor. On the outside, this is a big but nondescript country home. Inside, this is something special. The home of collector Charles Paget Wade, the house became his museum, where he housed his vast collections of, well, pretty much anything he could get his hands on. Today, much of his collection remains in the building. On one hand, you could call him a preserver of beautiful things. On the other, you could call him an elaborate hoarder. Tewkesbury is next at number 8, the largest town on our list. At its heart is Tewkesbury Abbey, a former Benedictine abbey, now a large parish church, where we met a very sassy lady who wanted to make sure that we knew we were visiting on Good Friday. We knew. Stow on the Wold is at number 7, and it's the home of the most Instagrammable door in the entire British Isles. And don't we love a good door, as well as the oldest pub in Britain, which has been serving ale continuously since 947 AD, even if it's been decorated a few times since then. Well, if people have been drinking here since 947 AD, then it would be rude not to join them, wouldn't it? Number 6, Laycock is a beautifully preserved timber frame town. 
even if its streets are littered with residents' cars for some reason. And next door is Laycock Abbey, a nunnery that was converted into a country house after the dissolution of the monasteries by Henry VIII. It was the home of the Talbot family, which includes Henry Fox Talbot, a photography inventor who captured what is now the oldest surviving photo negative in the entire world, an image of a window from the Abbey dating from 1835. Anyway, I'm going to change the subject here, but are you sure you, it's pronounced Laycock and not Lacock? Pipe down. Number 5, and we have Upper and Lower Slaughter. The slaughters sit only a mile apart, but are both well worth your time. Idyllic and quaint, these villages epitomise that classic Cotswolds charm. So I'd like to think that the name Slaughter from Upper and Lower Slaughter comes from something to do with a, I don't know, a massacre or something happening here. But no, actually it's more to do with the fact that uh, the word slough uh, means wetland in Old English and it's to do with that and there's water and marshes and rivers and that's it. So no massacres here. Chipping Camden is at number four and it's a gorgeous market town. The word chipping is the old English word for market, so it's hardly surprising that an ancient marketplace sits at the town centre. In third place on our list is Bybury, which features Arlington Road, the most famous residential street in Britain. Built as wool stores in the 14th century, they housed weavers from the 17th century onwards, and now it features on the inside cover of all UK passports. In second place is Bolton on the Water. A stunning little town with a shallow river Windrush running through its centre, this is a big tourist destination with a plethora of family-oriented visitor attractions to keep the little ones entertained. What do you think is it that makes Burton on the Water such a pretty little town? Oh, it's beautiful. Any Coldfalls villages are beautiful, but add a river into it and you have it. It's beautiful. And in first place, is Castlecombe, an ancient village that revolved around the wool trade. Today, this is a gorgeously preserved hamlet that is quintessentially English and epitomises everything that people imagine when they think of a typical British village. And it's exactly that, a village with a couple of pubs and a hotel, but the tourists are here in force. At least they keep it parking free though, so we can see the village properly, not like Laycock. You've really got to be in your bonnet about the cars in Laycock, don't you? Well, you suppose Castle Coombe is called Castle Coombe? Well, I can imagine there was a castle. You're right, there was, right at the top um, of the hill. Combe. Well, and people would have had beautiful hair. No, hair. not comb, coombe. It's pronounced coombe. But it's C-O-M-B. Well, I'll put us all out of our misery. The word coombe is the Saxon word for valley, and we are in a valley, hence the reason why we walked down that really long hill earlier. Well, that's great. Isn't that's it just? Great. <laughs> After all our touring around the Cotswolds, we saved its very best destination until last. Britain's best palace. Forget Buckingham Palace, Kensington Palace, or even Windsor Castle. This is the real deal, and it had absolutely nothing to do with royalty. Located on the edge of the Cotswolds, just 10 miles from Oxford, it is the home of the Dukes of Marlborough, and is the only non-royal or non-episcopal dwelling to hold the title of palace in the UK. I think if we popped our name on the list for council houses, this might be what they come up with. Oh yeah, Oxford Council. <laughs> yeah, why not? A UNESCO World Heritage Site, Blenheim Palace was completed in 1722 and is a rare example of the English Baroque style. 
The land was given as a gift to John Churchill, the first Duke of Marlborough, for his military triumphs, including at the Battle of Blenheim in 1704, after which the palace is named. Over the resulting 400 years, Blenheim Palace has remained the family home of the Churchills, even if large sections of it are now open to the public. The most famous Churchill of all, Winston Churchill, was indeed born here, and though his own lifestyle was a little more modest, his achievements and legacy have felt all over the site, where there are statues and painting in his image aplenty. When many of the British country houses went into decline in, at the turn of the 20th century, the ninth duke was able to secure Blenheim's fortune by marrying Consuelo Vanderbilt, an American heiress to one of the largest fortunes of the Gilded Age. The marriage was doomed when the pair lived apart, but a sizable dowry was large enough to ensure that the palace was not sold off to become a hotel, hospital or just knocked down, as was common at the time. <laughs> Do you suppose that the royal family look at Blenheim Palace sometimes, green with envy that their palaces aren't quite as good as this? Well, the Queen owns six palaces, she can leave this one for us. Well, she's cut back, she used to own 30. We all have to make cutbacks when finances are tight. We eat out less. And she sells a palace. The two aren't remotely comparable. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, share and subscribe. And follow us on Instagram at 15 Degrees North. Make sure to tune in to our next video to see where in the world we end up next. See ya. Bye. <laughs>